In this short video, we're going to extend the idea of in, invertible transformation to transformations that go between two general real vector spaces. Such transformations are called isomorphisms. Let's look at the formal definition. So we have two general real vector spaces, V and W. We have a transformation who has V as the input space or the domain and W as the output space, the codomain. And we're going to say that this transformation is an isomorphism provided that it is both one to one and onto. So in that case, we'd say this transformation is invertible or a bijection. We could also say that the vector spaces V and W are isomorphic to each other. And then if the codomain is the same as the domain, we even have a more special word for it. We call it an automorphism. So the idea of isomorphisms or isomorphic is really very important in algebra. And if two spaces are isomorphic to each other, they share many algebraic properties, including their dimension. And that should make sense, because remember, if the dimension of the domain is smaller than the, the dimension of the codomain, uh, then there's really no way that we have, we don't have enough input to cover all of the output space, so it cannot be onto. And on the other hand, if the dimension of the domain is larger than the dimension of the codomain, then uh, we have too much input. And so the only way that we can find a target for all of the input is to reuse some of the output vectors. So two, at least two or more input vectors will get mapped to the same output vector, and then t is not one-to-one. -one. And so what we can say is that if we have an isomorphism between two vector spaces, which are finite dimensional, then we can say that their dimensions must equal each other. And so that gives us a very simple test. If V and W, so our, if our domain and codomain have different dimensions, then the transformation cannot be an isomorphism. Now the converse of our th previous theorem is also true. In other words, if you have two finite dimensional vector spaces with the same dimension, then you can find an isomorphism between those. Those vector spaces, just that one thing, the dimension, is enough to make them isomorphic to each other. And then, of course, we can combine those two in an if and only if statement. And those uh, theorems hold true even when we have infinite dimensional uh, vector spaces. Uh, but we have to replace dimension with the cardinality. So two vector spaces, V and W, are isomorphic to each other if and only if they have equal dimension. So we said that part of the definition is that if you have an isomorphism, it is invertible. Let's just see what that means. It means that you have an inverse transformation. You have an inverse transformation which goes the opposite direction and undoes the transformation t. It goes in the opposite direction in the sense that its domain is w, which was the codomain of t and its codomain is V, which was the domain of V. We call that the inverse. We write it with the superscript minus one, just as we've done before. And what it says is that uh, take any output from T, use that as input to T inverse, and you'll get the, as output from T inverse, the input you used for T. In other words, T and T inverse undo each other. If you start with a vector V and W, T does something to it 
then T inverse undoes that and you're back with the same vector V in our input space V. On the other hand, if you take a vector in W, that would be used as input to T inverse. T inverse does something to it, but whatever it does, T undoes that and you're back with the same vector W. T inverse would be unique and the other way that we can say that they undo each other is that when you compose them you get the identity operator. So if I do T inverse composed with T it's the identity operator on the V space because when I write it in this order I'm taking a vector V and, and applying T to it that'll give me a vector in W I'll undo that, which gives me a vector back in V, and it's the same vector. And the same idea when I compose T with T inverse, I get the identity operator on W. And so, uh, and if you have an automorphism, then V equals W, so you get a s slight simpl simplification. Um, we have a very simple way of finding the matrix representation of the T inverse transformation or isomorphism, uh, we just start with by finding the matrix for matrix representation of T. And once we have that matrix representation of T, we just calculate its inverse. That will give us the matrix representation of T inverse. So let's look at an example. Again, this is a, an example we've used in many uh, videos where we have a, the basis b, x squared e to the negative 3x, x e to the negative 3x, and just e to the negative 3x. Uh, we know that the uh, differentiation on this, uh, the span of this subspace is an operator and we have found its standard matrix uh, in previous examples. And this matrix we know is invertible. Why? It's a lower triangular matrix and none of the diagonal entries are zero. And so we can go ahead and use some technology uh, to calculate the inverse and of that matrix. The inverse of that matrix is the standard matrix or the matrix representation of the D inverse operator. Now, since D is differentiation, undoing differentiation should be anti-differentiation. So if I wanted to calculate the antiderivative of a linear com combination of functions in a uh, span of B, then uh, I could just use the matrix representation, multiply it times the corresponding coordinate vector, so the coefficients are 5, negative 8, and positive 2, and the result will give me the coefficients on the antiderivative. And so I really, I mean, if I'm asking the question, I have to be a little bit careful here because I notice that I put a plus C here and um, that might not be correct if I'm looking for the inverse, so d inverse operating on this function. d inverse operating on that function would not have a plus c. If you add plus c, it is no longer in our space. But if the question is, what is a, the most general antiderivative? Well, we would want to put the plus C. So we have to be a little bit careful there. Um, in general, in this class, I should have left off the plus C. We're not in used, or no, we're not interested in the most general antiderivative. We're interested in the antiderivative that lies in span of B. So let's look at another application. So there we just did one derivative and undid the derivative. Well, what if we have multiple derivatives, a linear combination of multiple derivatives? 
That's the idea of uh, some differential equation. So if I have a function, y equals f of x, and I take a linear combination of that function and its derivatives, and if that equals another function, that's what we call a differential equation. Now there's an entire course of study devoted to solving differential equations, but we're going to look at a very simple case which applies to the work that we've been doing. So we'll take a linear combination of multiple derivatives and the function itself, get some output space, and we're going to try to find, well, if we're given, I said output space, output function, if we're given the output function, can we find the input function? What function satisfies this equation if we're given the right-hand side or output function g of x? So let's look at an example. I'm going to take 2 times the second derivative minus 5 times the first derivative plus 4 times the function itself, and that is going to equal this linear combination of functions that are in B, right? And so we're trying to try to find a solution. What does that mean? We're trying to find a function f of x, where when I take the second derivative of f, multiply it by 2, the first derivative, multiply it by negative 5, and the function itself, multiply it by 4, add those up, I'll get this function with coefficients 185, negative 281, and negative 188. Now, the reason why we can solve this using our approach is because we know that if the output is a linear combination of the functions and the derivatives, and the output is a linear combination of the functions in B, then the function itself has to be a linear combination of these functions in B. So we can define a linear transformation whose domain and codomain are both the span of B. And the way we define it is we say, oh, the image of our function f is 2 times its second derivative minus 5 times its first derivative plus 4 times the function itself. Well, how can we rewrite that? Well, using our d operator. Well, the first derivative is just d. The second derivative would be apply d twice, so that would be d squared. And then not doing anything to the function would be the identity operator on w. Remember, if we just take the identity operator, apply it to f, we just get f back. And that's what we want for that last term. Now, if that is our transformation t in terms of d and the identity operator, then we can actually calculate its matrix by taking the matrix for d and squaring it, multiply it by 2, then minus 5 times the matrix for d, and then minus 4 times the matrix for the identity operator, which is the identity matrix. So we can go ahead and work out that matrix algebra, and our result is the matrix representation for this differential transformation T. And we can use some technology to convert its inverse, because why do we want the inverse? Well, we say that when the input is f, we want the output to be 185x squared e to the negative 3x minus 281x e to the negative 3x minus 188e to the negative 3x. So what input would give us that output? Well, we need to undo t. And how do we undo, undo t? With t inverse. And so the way to evaluate t inverse of this function that we had on the right-hand side would be to multiply 
the matrix for T inverse times the component vector for that function. Remember, the component vector is just the vector of coefficients. And so when I multiply that out, I get, interestingly enough, nice integers, 5, negative 3, and negative 7. Those are the coefficients, then, on the function f that satisfies that differential equation. Here's another application, polynomial curve fitting. And the idea behind polynomial curve fitting is we are given some specified fixed points, and we're asked to find a polynomial which passes through those points. So for example, we want to find a cubic polynomial, or it could be, it's P3, uh, so, but it has four points, so it has to be a cubic polynomial. Uh, which passes through these points. So negative 4, comma, negative 198, negative 1, comma, 102, 2, comma, negative 48, and 3, comma, negative 58. So we're looking for a polynomial, a cubic polynomial, where when the input is negative 4, the output is negative 198, where the input is negative 1, the output has to be 102, and it's the same polynomial, right? And when the input is 2, the output is negative 48, and when the input is 3, the output is negative 58. So what we're doing is we're evaluating our polynomial, the unknown polynomial, p of x, at the input values, x equals negative 4, x equals negative 1, x equals 2, and x equals 3. And we want to choose our unknown p of x so that the output values are negative 198, 102, negative 48, and negative 58. So evaluating, we got that in orange. Why? Because we had an evaluation transformation. If we put those input values as a vector a, so negative 4, negative 1, 2, 3, we had an evaluation homomorphism. And we wrote that with uppercase e for evaluation. We put the vector a as a subscript to say that those are the points where we're performing the evaluation. Our domain is the a space of third degree polynomials or less, so P3. And what do we get out of that? We get their values. We get the Y values, which we'll put in a vector. And so that output space is R4. And so that's how we can define our evaluation homomorphism or evaluation transformation. And so what we're doing is we're looking for an input to that transformation, some polynomial, where the output is negative 198, 102, negative 48, and negative 58, that vector in R4. So the way that we could find P of x is by undoing this evaluation transformation. And we undo it with its inverse. So I would need to find the inverse of the vector in R4 with components negative 198, 102, negative 48, and negative 58. So we need the inverse of the evaluation transformation. And we'd like to use the matrix representation, but in order to get the matrix representation, we first need the matrix representation of the evaluation transformation itself. Remember that the domain is P3, so we'll use the standard basis for P3 to find the matrix representation. And again, how do we do that? Well, we find the image of all of the basis vectors. 
And in this case, we're saved a little bit of work because the codomain is R4. We don't need to encode the output vectors or the images uh, as component vectors because they're already component vectors. They are vectors in R4. So I find the using our evaluation, I evaluate these basis polynomials at our given points, which are negative 4, negative 1, 2, and 3. So we just have a vector of all 1s. This, the image of x is just going to be the same input values, then the input values squared, and the input values cubed. Now we take those vectors in R4 and use them as the columns of our matrix representation. And now we've got a 4x4 four four vector. We're definitely going to use a technology to calculate its inverse. But once we have the inverse, now we can find the polynomial that we're looking for. If we multiply the inverse times the y values, the vector of y values that are specified, uh, then we will get a vector in R4. Those are the components of the polynomial components, the coefficients of the polynomial that we're looking for. And there it is.